This is the trial of Job, uh, the world's oldest drama from the Old Testament, the book of Job. Uh, this may be the way this old man told it to these children. Job was the greatest man of the East. He looked up to and honored by all the people. One day he was taking his followers up to the mountaintop to worship God. And God and Satan were talking together up in the sky. And God said, Behold my servant Job. He does all the good things. And so he gets all these grants from me. And uh, Satan says, Yeah, but he's only doing that because you give him all this stuff. Take him away and watch how quickly he'll turn on you. He said, Well, do what you want. So Satan looks about, sees all his cattle, a uh, great part of his wealth, and he brings the marauders out of the, the Sabians to steal all the oxen and kill all Job's followers. Only one escapes. And then his 3,000 camels, a major portion of his wealth, were well guarded, but Satan brought three bands of Chaldean marauders from afar. They killed all but one of Job's servants and took away all the camels. Job's 7,000 sheep were too many and too spread out to steal. Another way must be found to deprive Job. A great storm began to gather. The sky grew dark and the winds increased rapidly. A lightning began to flash. A great bolt smashing toward the sheep. The lightning caused a huge fire and destroys all Job's sheep, land, and men. Only one escaped unharmed. The three men find Job, telling him of the great disasters that destroyed all his wealth and the horrible loss of, loss of his animals and workers. Job is stunned. Uh, not understanding why this has happened, he still accepted as God's will. He remains strong in faith, does not sin, and still worships God. And then Satan is so upset. This guy's a little tougher nut than he thought to crack. He finds his seven sons and three daughters having a lot of feasting together one day in one of the homes. He brings a great storm out of the desert and destroys all the children, kills all, seven, all ten at one time, seven sons and three daughters. He brings uh, the, it's the catastrophe brought, brought to Job <laughs> is far worse than losing his wealth. List all his children in one blow. He's completely stunned. And as the custom of the days, he shaves his head, rents his clothes, and lays in great anguish for many days. Then he goes back finally to the mountaintop, worshiping God again, will not turn from him. Satan is really upset now. He says, but you wouldn't let me touch him. Maybe he doesn't really care about his children. He says, okay, he's under your control. Do what you want, only spare his life. So the next day, Job wakes up with the eruptions of great painful boils all over his body, all over his body from head to foot. Uh, many days passed as Job sat in the soft ashes trying to scrape off excruciating, horrible sores, uh, trying to do some, get some relief of some kind. The wife speaks after a while and says, curse God so you might die and be relieved from these terrible, unbearable agonies. He said, oh, you're a foolish woman. Don't say such things like that. Why shall I expect only God, good things from God and no bad? Once more, he does not turn away from his acceptance of what he thinks is God's will. He is overcome by great depression, unable to understand why this severe punishment is being placed upon him. Three friends come to comfort Job in his affliction. Eliphaz, Baldad, and Zophar, all leaders of neighboring tribes, at first sight, they did not recognize him. He had so fallen from a great man they knew. Seeing his friends in good health, Job laments, Why no light in my misery, no lamp to my bitter soul? Uh, Bildad, the Shuite, is suspicious that Job has done something wrong and perhaps his children deserve to die. The other calamities equally deserved. Job must be evil. Surely he is lying as he protests his innocence. Job answers bitterly, I may have some faults unknowingly, but measure me against other men. No one has striven more than me. For righteousness, I stand above all others. Job is now getting a little self-righteous. So far, the Naamite, you must have sinned to receive such punishment from God. Repent and admit your guilt, then God will remove your punishment. He says, I am innocent. Why is God heedless of my suffering? If this happens to me, what can other men expect? And he says, I'm not going to argue with you anymore. I'm going to turn my arguments to God. And Elphaz, the older, said, uh, 
tough if your form of uh, Job's form was goodness, but why has he fallen away? No man is wholly good. There are some faults in all. It says, admit your wrongdoing and God might forgive you. And he says, how long will you torment me and crush me with accusation? God's hand is heavy despite my groaning. Where might I find him? One says, now you speak blasphemy. They all turn on Job, making more accusation, condemning him and charging him that he must have done many things that displease God. Finally, the Job turns from them, saying he will no longer talk with them, his only good arg arguments made with God. I'm willing to accept all this punishment. Tell me why. I have obeyed you in everything. Will you avenge me against my attackers? Uh, for someone so righteous as I, what kind of comfort is this? And as they argue and talk, this young man hears him, uh, Elihu the Buzite, a young poet and writer, listening nearby, interrupts after waiting to hear the wisdom from his elders, but found none. You chose Job without proof, and Job has become self-righteous. Job, you justified yourself rather than God, although your past was pure and your faith strong. The young man, perhaps the writer of the book of Job, speaks but only as a man. The sky begins to darken and a storm gathers. An enormous wind accompanies the group and a mighty voice of God thunders forth. All you who speak are just words of men. Now answer my questions. He opens uh, within their minds and he speaks to them. Is it you who give the ravens food to feed its young or teach it to build the nest in a safe place? Did you give the oxen the strength to pull the plow? Do you protect the young lions from harm and find them a home? Does the hawk need your man-made maps to find its way unerringly? Did you deliver the mountain goat of its young or teach them sure-footedness greater than your best athletes? Did you give the eagle its power to sight food from the rocky crag to find materials to build its nest on high? You think the ostrich is stupid, but he can outrun your fastest horse. Do you make it so? Do you guide the bear with the cubs and keep it warm in the winter? Do you give the horse its fearlessness in battle? With rage he races into danger. Did you build the mountains or make the rains to fall? Do you create the seeds to make the grasses grow or make the rivers flow in all their directions? Can you freeze the waters of the north land, build the mountains or create the colors of the sky? Do you design the boundaries of the oceans, gather the waters to fill them and direct the movements of the tides? Have you walked under their depths and brought forth the great wonders from the bottom of the silt and sand? A job uh, humbled and erupts, I am uh, insignificant. I lay my hand on my mouth and speak no more. God, is not finished, continues his, uh, present his presentation. His voice thunders. Behold the behemoth, so great in power, can you stand against him? He is so unalarmed from the Jordan River, rushes to his mouth, I'll lay your hand on him. He guards iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. Even your arrow cannot make him flee. God shows them the whole earth where they're less than a pinprick on the earth. Then the universe, where the earth is just a dot. Man can have meaning only with his association with God that created everything. The voice stops, a ray of light penetrates the storm as it clears. Job asks nothing for himself, only forgiveness for his friends. He now understands how foolish all his arguments were without knowledge. God removes the evil punishment from placed on Job by Satan. Job is healed. His trial is over and God grants him his pardon. From one coin and one ring given by each of his brothers, sisters, and friends, Job rebuilds his wealth double than before. His herds count 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen. He is again the leader and judge over all the people of the land, the greatest man of the East. Job begot seven more sons and three more daughters, more perfect than those he lost before. In all the land, no woman found as fair as his daughters. His sons did great honor to their father. One of the three most honored men of the Bible, he saw his sons and grandsons to four generations. 
and he lived to be 400 years of age. And that's the end of the story of Job.